Well, good morning. You guys happy to be here on Resurrection Sunday? I can't think of anything better I would rather be doing, that's for sure. Although I got to admit, and looking at the crowd and, and what we're doing here, I'm a, a lot more nervous than usual. I don't usually get nervous preaching. I, I'm, I'm extra nervous. In fact, I said to my wife, I said, honey, I don't think I've been this nervous since our honeymoon. And she said, she said, honey, you'll do better this time. If you have your Bibles and you want to open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that will be our passage today that we'll be using, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are all victorious. And I don't know about you, but I love to watch movies about victory, whether it be a war movie like Braveheart. But my favorite type of victory movies would have to be sports movies. I love sports victory movies because I love sports. And uh, my favorite sports movie of all time has to be Hoosiers. I love that movie. In fact, uh, uh, I, the regional, I believe, that they filmed was, was right here in this place. And, and that was just such an exciting movie because this underdog story of this little school, and it's based on a true story, this little school that never should have been there kept fighting away. And finally, they overcome all odds, and they won the state championship against the much bigger school. They had this great victory. And there's just something about watching that victory that gets us so excited and so fired up. And, 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 and maybe you've experienced a personal victory that's beyond watching it in the movies. Maybe you were on a great championship team. Um, when I was in Bible college, Kentucky Christian College, uh, um, we had a great basketball program. It was so good that there was no way. I, I knew I wasn't going to make the team, so I thought, I want to be a part of this. So I became the trainer, the athletic trainer and manager for the team. And, and, and I traveled all over the country with the team, and it was a lot of fun. And, and we, every year we would inch closer to that national championship in the National Christian Collegiate Athletic Association. And we would inch closer, but we would just come up short. And finally, my senior year, and, 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 and some of our senior years, the guys that have been fighting alongside me, my senior year, we overcome a deficit in the championship. We came from behind, and we won on the back of my good friend Ty, uh, Ty Barnes, who just took the game over, and we won the national championship and got to cut down the nets in our biggest rival, Cincinnati Christian University's gym. Now, there's nothing better than that, folks. Cutting down the nets in your rival gym is awesome, and that's what we got to do. And I will never forget that. And maybe you experienced a sports championship or a band championship or, or an academic championship or a softball, some type of championship where you experienced just a little taste. But you know what you discover is? Those championships are great when they happen. They're great when they happen. But really, after it's all over, they're, they're not that great. As time goes on, yes, I got a ring, and yes, I, I think fondly on it, but it really doesn't mean that much to me today. Long after it fades away, and that trophy is gone, and eventually, if you didn't realize this or not, all trophies are going to end up being gone. They're going to burn up on this earth someday. It won't mean much. In fact, professional sports team, they win one, and then what do they do? They go right back to trying to win the next one. They can't even enjoy the one they got. But I'm here to tell you, through Jesus Christ, we have a victory that will never fade away. It will last forever. And it's a great victory. It is the most great victory of all time. The Apostle Paul describes it in the 57th verse of this chapter when he says, But thank God He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you look at the very first of this chapter, he begins by saying this. Listen as we read the first four verses. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and, and you still stand firm in it. It is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. Now listen to what he says. I passed on to you what was the most important, the most important, and what was that? 
What I had passed on to you, what had been passed on to me, he says. That Christ died for our sins, just as Scripture said. That he was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, just as Scripture said. So Peter says, or Paul says, listen, you know what the most important thing is? What is the of first importance? If I was to give you one important thing that you can't ever lose sight of, that one most important thing, what would it be? It's this, that Christ died for you. That he was buried in the tomb, therefore proven that he was dead. And then he rose again on the third day, defeating the final enemy, that is death. He says that is what is most important. That is the most important thing. you got to understand that when you get a victory in everything else, it fades away. But all, everything in human history hinges on this one thing. In fact, when the stone was rolled away, what we understood is that we have resurrection and victory in every part of our lives. And I just want to give you three things that I think if you don't leave here a little more victorious today, then there's something wrong. Three things that that, that I understand from Scripture that this celebration that Jesus gives us. And the first one is this, Jesus gains us victory over sin and its eternal consequences. He gives us victory over sin and its eternal consequences. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Because I don't think we often do. We all have a problem. And it's a problem called sin. Every one of us in this room. Would you raise your hand if you're in this room? All right. 100% of you should be raising your hand. 100% of you are sinners who fall short of the glory of God. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal to most people. So we all sin and we all mess up. But what we fail to understand is that we have a good and perfect holy God. And he cannot be in the presence and in fellowship with sin. It's not possible. Why is it not possible? Well think about it this way. If you have a judge in a murder trial, can he go out and have drinks and fellowship with the defendant in the murder trial? That wouldn't be right. It would taint his judgment. He is the justice, and, 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 and he cannot be around that. But even to a greater extent, God is perfect, and he's holy, and he's the judge of the universe. And he cannot be around sin. So we have this sin problem. The wages of sin is death, Scripture teaches us. It is death. It's a bill that we can't pay because it's eternal death. It's not just physical death. But it's eternal death that will last forever. It's separation from God for all eternity. And and so what we learn is that we have this wage, this bill that we cannot pay. And and you say, well, what's that mean? Well, if I have this $1 million medical bill, it doesn't matter how much I pay. I'm probably never going to be able to pay that back, right? I'm never going to make that much money in my lifetime. Well, Well, your bill is a zillion times more that in sin. And you can't pay it back. But here's the deal. Jesus paid it for you. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world because Jesus lived a sinless life. He is the only one that did not deserve to die, but He is the only one who was qualified to die for our sins. God allowed Jesus to die in our place. In His justice, He upheld His standard of staying away from sin by having our sin paid for by Jesus. Author Max Cicado says that The cross is where God forgave his children without lowering his standard. Now that's a victory worth celebrating, folks. I want to give you two verses that I think you cannot forget when it comes to this victory. Listen closely to Romans chapter 8. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Would you read that with me? So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. 
you understand what's happened? There is no more condemnation for you. I don't care how bad you've messed up. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how bad somebody else thinks you are. It doesn't matter when you come to Jesus. He washes you white as snow. He makes you clean. And it's as if you have never, ever sinned because it's been paid for by Jesus. And that is victory, folks. In fact, Peter says it. That, 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 that we're washed as white as snow. And the psalmist says, purify me with my sins and make me clean. Wash me whiter than snow. Now, here's what I want you to know. We're as white as snow. You got a t-shirt today when you came in here. And the whole point is that this is the first time that we've ever been under one roof in years. With all of our family together. And we wanted a unifying principle to show that we are not only one, but we are washed white as snow as one. When God looks at us, he sees one big white out. And so if you don't have your shirt on, why don't you take some time to put it on right now? We have been washed white as snow. Yes, white as snow. We are washed clean, folks. So maybe you have some baggage in your past. It's time to leave it at the foot of the cross. Maybe you have some mess-ups in your past. Yes, there's earthly consequences. There's things you got to deal with. It. But as far as you're standing with God, you are like an angel. You are perfect. You are beyond perfect. You have been made perfect through the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And that is victory. But Jesus doesn't just gain us victory over our sin and our past and our consequences. Jesus gains us victory over death. I mean, the most feared thing on the planet, whether you're a, 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 a Christian or a non-Christian, oftentimes is death. People say, well, I just don't know what happens there. I'm afraid of death. It's, it's, all, it's ultimately the worst thing that can happen to a person on earth if they don't have the hope of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that it's the one thing you have in common with everybody on the planet? Other than being a sinner, the only thing you have in common with everybody on the planet is if Jesus does not come back in their lifetime, they will die. Rich, poor, powerful, weak, red, yellow, black and white, doesn't matter who you are, you will face death. If you live long enough. The Bible says it is appointed unto all men once to die and after that judgment. Did you know there's actually a website out there? It's called the death clock. It's a real morbid thing, but you can put your information in there and it calculates the approximate time that, uh, 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 that your life sh will be over. I checked mine this week and it appears that I will expire Sunday, March 2nd, 2047. I got another 34 years, I guess, I guess. Kind of morbid to think about. But the reality is, they can try to calculate my death, but I could die today. I'm not promised another breath of life. So we all face it. But folks, through Jesus Christ, we understand something. Jesus overcame death. And he brings us life. The Apostle Paul said in verse 14, And if Christ had not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. But he has indeed been raised from the dead. And Paul wants them to know that. And, and maybe you're here today and you're not a Christian. You kind of have some questions about this resurrection thing. And I want you to know we accept it on faith, but it's not blind faith. There are dozens of scriptural proofs, dozens of extra scriptural proofs outside of scripture. There's historical evidence. And here's what Paul does in this chapter. He says, listen. Let me tell you about some people you know, because you've met them, who've seen this. He says in verse 5, And he was seen by Peter and the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of them who are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared, or then he was seen by James, and later by all the apostles. And then he says, last of all, as though I had not been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Paul says, listen, you trust me, you know me. I saw the resurrected Lord. He appeared to me on the road to Damascus. 
He's saying, listen, you've seen all these witnesses. Now, one of all the great archaeological evidences of Jesus and all of those things that they can't prove his tomb has anybody in it, it's empty, all those things, what proves it most to me is the changed life of the apostles who saw them. Have you ever thought about that? Peter and the apostles went from hiding behind a locked door, denying they knew Jesus, to preaching him on the corner no matter the consequences. Now, I know a lot of men... A lot of people who would die for something they thought was true. But I've never met one who would die for something they knew was not true. That they knew was a hoax. And they saw Jesus so they knew it was real. And they believed it was real. And they said, you know what? We don't care if they kill us now. What's the worst can happen? They can kill us on this earth. But believe me, that's not that bad. Because we get to go to someplace far greater with Jesus. And that is the power we have through Jesus. In fact, John chapter 11 Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. And then the most famous part of this chapter, chapter 15, Paul quoting from the Old Testament, he said, death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For uh, 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 For sin is the sting that results in death, and law gives sin to power. But thank God, He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You see, Jesus rose from the grave, and He proved that death had been defeated. And folks, that means that we too, He said, listen, You'll be raised imperishable. In other words, Jesus was raised imperishable. He only died once. He's not going to die again. And neither will you. You'll die once, but you'll be raised to never die again. This gives me the most hope of anything I've ever heard. In our line of work, I, 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 I preach a lot of funerals. And while I'm sad always to say goodbye, there's this incredible peace when I know that they know Jesus because I know that it's not goodbye, but it's see you later. This last fall, we lost a dear friend around here. When Tracy Zare passed away, pretty suddenly, one of the closest friends that we have yet me and even her husband Alex can stand up at a funeral and proclare that Jesus Christ is the Lord why because we know that no matter what happened to Tracy she is with Jesus she is in a far better place and death is not the worst thing that can happen to us in fact not knowing Jesus is the worst thing because she is now in a better place where she needs no more medical attention she has no more disabilities she has no more pain she's in a place where we'll live forever where there's no more fighting about silly things there's no more wars there's no more cancer there's no more need for wheelchairs there's no more need for any of these things they've all passed away and we all because of what Jesus did will overcome death and get to join her there and live forever and ever in the place that is perfect as it's supposed to be and I think that's the greatest victory of all and while I look at her family I go into work every day and and work with her mom Tracy's mom and I spend time with Alex and her little girl. I know beyond any shadow of a doubt that we will all be together again. And you can have that assurance as well. I'm telling you, death has been swallowed up in the victory of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't end there, folks. While, 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 while Jesus gains us victory over sin and Jesus gains us victory over death, one of the greatest parts of the Easter story, one of the things that we forget a lot is that Jesus gains us victory for life. He really does. I think this is one of the most overlooked parts of the Easter story. We often think, you know, I think it's great that Jesus paid for my sins and I can be forgiven. And I think it's great that one day I'm going to have the hope of heaven. Those are good things. I like those. But that doesn't help me now. You know, I still don't know how I'm going to pay the next mortgage. I still have this medical problem that the doctor says is going to be tough to get through. My family still broke apart. 
My spouse is still leaving me. My pain is still here. I still can't find work. And you're thinking, I love that I have this forgiven past and I have this hope in the future, but what about right now? How does that help me in today? And I want you to know that that's what Paul wants you to see. It changes everything for today. It's not just a a past forgiven and a future hope. Those are great things. But there's this resurrection power at work in us today. When when the stone rolled away from the grave, there was uh, proof to us that there's no obstacle that can't be overcome in your life. You see, because of the empty tomb, because of what Jesus did to you, there's nothing you can't overcome. In verse 58, Paul says, So, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastic for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. And when Paul wanted to remind his readers of this, he would say, Listen, I I, I want you to get this. Wrap your mind around this. The same power... The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and living in you. He says, listen, it's like he says, if Christ can do this, look at the tomb. If Christ can do this, then he can do this. If he can do that, he can do this. There's nothing he cannot do. And so he would say to the church, he would say to the Ephesian church when he was encouraging them to live in the faith and to not give up, he would say, I pray. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power who who, who is in us or for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power, the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. He says it's the same power. He says to the Philippian church, I want you to know Christ and the power of the resurrection. And when you know the power of the resurrection, you got to understand it changes everything about your life. It changes everything. It will help you get through those trials. It will help you get through those problems. It will help you overcome. But here's what I want you to not miss. The greatest thing it does is not help you through your everyday problems. Those are good, but that can be kind of selfish, right? If we're only counting on the resurrection power to help us with our problems, that's kind of selfish. The resurrection power wasn't meant just for that. In fact, I think it was primarily given to us for the mission of Christ. He gave us this Holy Spirit power, not so we'd be comfortable, not so that we would have all our problems overcame. He gave us the Holy Spirit power so that we would understand that we have a mission and He's in us. We don't do it alone. We have the same Jesus that raised Christ from the dead. We have the same power in us to take the mission of Christ to the world. You see, one of the biggest things that helps us overcome is living the ordinary, normal, American dream life, folks. When we call you to Christ, we ain't calling you to be Sunday-only Christians. We ain't calling you to be Christmas and Easter Christians. When you you know the power of the resurrection, you can't be an average Christian. You can't be a play Christian. You can't play church and only show up when it's convenient. When you have the power of the resurrection in you, it turns your life upside down. It causes a a member of this church, a young man named Marty Welp, to say, you know what, I've come to Christ and I was living this life of sin and now I want to do something different. And he moves to Haiti where he's working to help the poorest to poor. That's what it does, folks. It turns your life upside down. It causes Jeremiah and Aaron Smith, Dan and Karen Smith who are members of this church, it causes those, those that, that young parents, they just adopted kids from Rwanda. It causes them to say, you know what, we're going to pack up and move our comfortable home and ministry in South Carolina. We're moving to, the, to a, a project in inner city Atlanta where we're going to also lead this, uh, this, this adoption ministry, but we're also going to take our time to invest in the poor and the apartments that we're living in so we can win them to Christ. It, it causes a young man like Jason Denton who was in trouble with the law, who was down on his luck, who had spent a lot of time in jail to say, you know what, I want to give my life to Christ. I know my past is forgiven. And then he started going to Bible college, and now he's preaching Easter Sunday at Equity Christian Church, and he's the best witness I know for Jesus Christ. You see, that's what the power of the resurrection does. It will not leave you where you're at. It will not leave you comfortable. It will turn you upside down and know there's nothing you can't do. And there's nothing you won't do do for Jesus. Because he did so much for you, you can't stand but to live for him. To take his message everywhere you go. Because people's eternities depend on it. 
And that's what the resurrection will do. Last week I watched a, a documentary. It won Best uh, Documentary, an Oscar for that in 2011. And this part is not all in, in the movie, but it's a great movie to watch. But what Undefeated is about, there's this uh, little school or this school in, in the poorest part of Memphis, Tennessee. It's called Manassas High School. And they hadn't won a football game in like 10 years. Their, their, their kids, most 90% of the kids on the team had lost their dads to gun violence or they just left. And, and it was rough. But across town in a, in, a, in a little church, a Sunday school teacher challenged some of the men in his class to say, you know what, you guys need to go over there and help that football team. Some of you, 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 you guys, you're men, you're manly men. You could go over there and you can make a difference. And one of those men decided he was going to do it. Bill Courtney said, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot. He drove across town. He was a construction worker, never coached a day in his life. He didn't know a lot about coaching football, but he knew a lot about life. And Bill went over there, and he went into the school, and he said, listen, I will volunteer for free to coach your football team. They tossed him a whistle. Immediately, he said, good luck. He showed up for practice, and half the kids were there, and they were getting fights every day. Four weeks in, he is ready to hang it up. He's ready to quit. He calls one of the team leaders in there, one of the captains. He says, will I ever get the respect of this team. The leader said, Coach, you already got our respect. It's not our respect that you need to earn. What we're wondering is, are you a turkey man? He said, what in the world does that mean, a turkey man? He said, well, every year during the holidays between Thanksgiving and Christmas, a lot of people from your side of town, they come on down here and they buy us presents and they provide food and we appreciate it because we can't afford it. But then they get back in their fancy cars and they drive back over there and they talk in their huddles about what they did. But they don't really care about us. They just care about feeling good about themselves. So we wonder if you're a turkey man. Bill said, I knew at that moment I was a turkey man and I never wanted to be a turkey man again. And he poured his heart and his soul into life, and they went undefeated and won a state championship with a team that hadn't won a game in 10 years. And more than that, he raised up some young men into real men with character. I want to tell you, church, I think some of us live once a year for Easter, and we're turkey men and women spiritually. All around the holidays, around the special services, we get fired up about it. But we don't realize we have a power for the rest of the earth, the rest of the years, the rest of our time in our life. We're living this normal status quo, keep up with the American dream life. When God says, I got something far greater for you, you can make an eternal difference. What are you doing today that will make a difference a thousand years from now? I can tell you, leading people to Jesus Christ, living in the resurrection power and telling them about the resurrection power. So church, what I'm challenging you here is let's stop being turkey men and let's be resurrected, empowered Christians for Jesus Christ 365 days a year. How about that church? Can we do that? Can we stand up and stop playing church? Can we stand up and stop pretending that we are Christians and live in the resurrection power every single day of our lives? And if we do that, it's unbelievable what an impact we can have on this community. There will not be a building big enough to hold us in a few years for Easter services if we do that. And so, that's what I'm challenging you to do. To stand for Him. Jesus called us to that when he said to go into the entire world. So just remember victory. Victory over sin. Victory over death. And victory in life. And remember Paul's word. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Father God in heaven, we are so thankful for the victory that comes in Jesus And Lord, we repent right now. We repent as a church, as individuals, when we are turkey Christians. When we live only in the moment, only in the high points, only in the holidays, only on Sundays. No, Lord, may we be empowered by your resurrection power to live every single day of our lives for you. May we understand that we're meant to love you, love people, and change the world one person at a time 
every single day of our lives. And may you help us do it. And if there's anyone here, Lord, who has never accepted you as Lord and Savior, may they understand what you've done for them. And may they not leave here without coming to you and claiming you as Lord and Savior of their life. And for the rest of us, Lord, who've called you Savior, may we live with you as Lord. And may we understand what that means. And may we make it our life to do everything in our power. Lord, you want to do immeasurably, abundantly more than we could ask or imagine in Christ Jesus in our lives through the church of Jesus Christ. And we are ready to do it. And we thank you for the victory that comes in you. And it's in Christ alone. It's in you alone that that's possible. And may we never forget it. And it's in his name that we pray and give you all the glory. Amen.